camera. <laughs> okay. I'm admitting. All right. Yeah, because I got the view lobby thing, but you're letting people in, huh? So I'm not seeing uh, the, the stuff pop up with the uh, the people are coming in, but maybe that's something different about this one too. Can you see people getting in, Paige? Go to the people tab at the yep, very top. I am letting people in. Do you see them come in? Oh my gosh, yes. There you go. Well, it is nine o'clock. I think a lot of people, uh, I think it looks like just jumping on their computer right now. So I think we'll give it another minute or two. Let a few more people uh, get logged in and then we will get started. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. So for those of you just logging on, please uh, be patient. We're probably going to give this another minute. Looks like we got quite a few people that are still um, still logging in to the webinar. We will get this started in the next, oh, I don't know, 60 seconds or so. Be patient. We will get going here pretty quick. Remind people to right click on Dave's camera to select fit to frame. What's that? Remind oh, yeah. Well, it's a couple minutes after the hour. I think we will uh, we will go ahead and get uh, today's webinar started. Uh, I've been instructed several times to remind uh, those of you watching, uh, we've got our camera on here in the conference room at, uh, at the office. Uh, the picture is gonna be more horizontal and if you're getting half the frame, uh, all you have to do on Teams is right click on the picture choose fit to frame and then you should get the uh, entirety of the conference room instead of getting half of it. Uh, I've had people tell me before that when I'm talking, which I always do with my hands, it seems like uh, that they can only see one arm moving. So at any rate, uh, if you'd like to do that, uh, go ahead and uh, looks like we got a pretty good crowd on here today. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. One of the other things that we mentioned last time uh, we're going to mention it again this time. I think it makes the flow of the call go better personally. Um, and that is, if you have any questions, you're certainly welcome to save those to the end. But what our preference would be is to go ahead and just type your question. If you have a question while I'm talking, type it right into the chat box. Um, one of the other presenters on here, probably Martha in the office with me, 
uh, will stop me. She will read your question and I'll answer it kind of in real time. Uh, I think that works better. I think it, uh, for me, it feels more uh, interactive. Uh, and I think it also helps you if you, sometimes if you stop right when you're, you have a question, I think it may help with uh, the context for the, uh, the rest of the call. So without further ado, we are going to go ahead and get started, start these slides moving and, uh, and get after a little bit. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody. This is our Commodity Market Basics is what we have titled this particular webinar. Uh, and, and this one is the result of some of the comments we've got back from prior webinars. Um, generally, the feedback has been positive, but one of the suggestions that was made, and we saw, saw this multiple times, is that we had several people that said, hey, look, this is great, but I feel like you started two or three or four rungs up on the ladder from where my knowledge base is. I'm young, I'm new in the industry. Uh, and I would like something that maybe started a little bit more basic that helps helps me to understand, you know, kind of how to look at markets and, and the growing cycles and things like that. So that's the actual goal today. Um, I suspect we've got some people on here that have been doing this a while. Some of this stuff might seem a little basic and a little bit rudimentary, but hopefully, uh, especially for the new people on here, people that are relatively new to the commodity business, uh, you find this interesting, you find this useful, you also find it maybe uh, hopefully a little bit uh, entertaining. So we will do uh, what we can. This is kind of what we're going to go through today. We're going to talk about really what is a commodity. Uh, it falls into a few categories here. We've got a couple of them up here. Generally, a commodity is either stuff we grow or stuff we dig up is kind of a way to look at it. The third category is kind of stuff we make out of stuff that we grow or we dig up. I'll show you some lists and talk a little bit more about that as we get through it. We're also going to talk a little bit about where we grow stuff, uh, where we grow stuff in the world to give you a little bit of a broader overview. Uh, we're going to kind of stick to the ag side of things here. We're going to stay out of the, uh, uh, the stuff we dig upside pretty much just more than anything in the interest of time. And we're also going to talk a little bit without getting too far off into the uh, agronomy detail ditch. Uh, talk a little bit about crop development stages. That's very, very important because one of the things that we'll show you is that, you know, we plant crops in the U.S. in the spring. We harvest crops in the U.S. in the fall. Weather is important during that period of time, but how important the weather is varies depending on what part of your uh, the crop development cycle is. So we're going to kind of try to talk you through that as well to, to help you really understand how these crops grow and how they, uh, uh, how they mature and then how they're harvested. We're going to look a little bit at supply and demand, but we're going to stay out of the detail ditch. We're going to try to teach you more to how to look at a commodity. We'll use some specific commodities in our example, but this is more designed to how do I look at a commodity? How do I assess supply demand balances and changes in there? And then how do those changes affect price? We're going to do that the best we can as well to try to make it simple for you. And then the harder part here is probably going to be talk a little bit about hedging. We're going to stay very high level. Um, many of you, certainly when I got in this industry 40 years ago, uh, you start talking about derivative hedging, my eyes would start to roll back into my head. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, try to simplify it, try to give you some ideas of, of why it's important and why it's useful to us in this industry. And then we're going to finish up today talking about USDA and USDA reporting and, and, and when those reports come out, which ones are more important than others and kind of how to look at them. So that's our agenda for the day. We're going to have to kind of hustle here just a little bit to get all this ground covered, but we will do our best. And we're going to start you off with a video today. Um, many of you may have not seen this movie, Trading Places. It was a Eddie Murphy movie uh, that came out in 1983. Not only is it an extraordinarily funny movie and worth your time, just if you like Eddie Murphy humor, um, but it should be required viewing for anybody new to the commodity business. I would encourage it uh, I would encourage it very highly. They've got some pretty cool scenes uh, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with the Chicago Board of Trade back then, uh, the actual trading pits. Now, those are obsolete. We don't have them anymore. Everything is electronic. Uh, I'm sure that's more efficient and works better, but it's not nearly as entertaining as things maybe used to be. So it's a very worthwhile movie. I would encourage you to watch it. 
This is one of the scenes very early in the move in the movie where the owners of a commodity trading firm are talking to a new employee who is Eddie Murphy about what a commodity is. And that's what we're going to start with. I've got another clip. We are here to try to explain to you what it is we do here. We are commodities brokers, William. Now, what are commodities? Commodities are agricultural products like coffee that you had for breakfast, wheat, which is used to make bread, pork bellies, which is used to make bacon, which you might find in a bacon and lettuce and tomato sandwich. Um, I'll give you more of that clip. I, I don't, I've seen that a hundred times and I still giggle uh, every time I look at it. If you Googled commodity, uh, this is kind of the first thing that pops up. So I thought I would start with the classic definition. A commodity is a raw material or primary agricultural product that can be bought or sold, such as copper or coffee. When you start looking into the commodity categories, and these are very incomplete lists, but this will kind of give you an idea. Um, many of you on here are buying value-added food products for a food company that you work for. Well, those value-added products, generally speaking, are not commodities. They are not readily traded, but most of them are made out of commodities. And often, one of the things that you'll find is that most of the changes that you see from your suppliers on the price side, much of that is caused by underlying movement in the commodity markets. Uh, one of the analysis we did at my past place of employment, and I bought quite a bit of refined vegetable oil, uh, we did a little bit of research and figured out that for the rail cars of refined soybean oil that I was buying, between 92 and 93 percent of the price changes that we saw from time to time in, in the price of that refined oil actually was represented by the underlying moves in crude soybean oil prices as represented by the futures contracts. So um, while you might look at this and you might say, what does this mean to me? Major food company that I used to work for, a, a very large portion of our overall cost of goods sold and most of the changes in the, those costs of goods that we had were caused by movements in the underlying commodity. This is the most volatile or one of the most volatile pieces of the cost chain that you are trying to help your company manage. So that's why commodities are important. Mentioned earlier, three basic categories, stuff we grow. You can see that list, agricultural products, everything from coffee, orange juice, to corn and soybeans and winter wheat and all the different kinds of wheat. There's stuff we dig up. These are generally energy products and minerals, as you can see from the list there. And then there is a group of value-added products, generally one step removed from the commodity uh, stuff we make. Um, generally, that's always stuff we make out of stuff that we either dig up or grow. In other words, all of these products are produced over here from one of the products in one of these two categories. The energy uh, part is, is very, very, uh, very, very clear. We make actually ethanol from corn. Uh, all these energy products down here in the middle uh, are made from our petroleum products, unleaded gasoline, diesel fuel comes out of uh, petroleum products. Uh, and then you've got some of the products made out of milk. You see milk over here in the stuff we grow category. Well, what do we use to do with milk? Well, we either consume it as whole milk, or we make it into butter or cheese or non-fat dry milk or whey. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. It is an incomplete list, but gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, some of the commodity categories. So now we're gonna get into kind of the planting dynamics. We're gonna start here with uh, where we grow stuff in the US and around the world. We're gonna look at the planting cycles. I'm not gonna to get too far into that, but I'll talk a little bit about kind of the times of year uh, that we're planting stuff, times of year it's growing, times of year we're harvesting stuff in different parts of the world. And then we're gonna get into a little bit more specifics, uh, like I said, without getting too far into, into the agronomy detail ditch uh, with how these crops develop, how they grow and, and what parts of the growing cycle uh, are important. So we're gonna start with the US, 
uh, because that's where we live and that's what's probably the most important part to us. One of the things I did want to mention here at this point of the discussion today, though, is when I started in the commodity business 40 years ago, it was a much more U.S. centric business. What was going on with these commodities in the U.S. was most of all you needed to know. But over the over the decades, that has changed quite a bit. Uh, first off, we are uh, bigger. We grow more agricultural products in the U.S. than certainly we did 40 years ago when I started. But the share of, of, of world trade that those represent has actually shrank, shrank quite a bit. I think 50 years ago, the U.S., uh, for example, was about 50% of all world exports of wheat came from the U.S. We were the breadbasket of the world. Now, we produce more wheat today in the U.S. than we did back then, but our share of world trade this year might not even be 10%. It, at best, will be 10 or 11%. So you kind of get to the idea that a lot of other places around the world are producing a lot more agricultural products. Uh, and because of that, this has become much more of a global market. The U.S. is still very, very important. These are still U.S. markets, but uh, what goes on in other places around the world is much, much more important than it was uh, certainly in days gone by. So you can see the chart here. Basically, the darker green is the higher concentration of products. You can kind of see where we grow corn. Um, Iowa is the big corn producing state, followed by Illinois. Uh, at least for the years represented on this. Uh, this is actually on the USDA website, uh, only goes through 2019. There's where we grow soybeans. You can see that's a bit more stretched out. I was a little bit surprised when we pulled this up that Iowa is actually bigger a little bit in soybean production than Illinois. Uh, was not that many years ago that Iowa was the big corn producing state and Illinois was the big soybean producing state, but uh, you can see where we grow uh, those crops. The other thing that has changed quite a bit in recent decades, uh, we're growing a lot more corn and a lot more soybeans, but especially a lot more soybeans up here in the Northern Plains. Uh, so, and then wheat is obviously a big product. Here's where we grow wheat in the US. Now there are several classes of wheat. I don't wanna get too far off into that detail ditch either, but generally speaking, the three major classes of wheat are hard red winter wheat, which is generally kind of grown out here in the Plain States. You can see the big concentration here in Kansas. Kansas is not only the big wheat producing state, it is the biggest by far uh, hard red winter wheat producing state. You see all this light green over here? This is soft red winter wheat. Now, Soft red winter wheat, we don't grow quite as much of it as we do hard red winter wheat, but the, the growing area, as you can see, is much more widely dispersed. And most of this up here is spring wheat. Uh, again, we'll get into that when we talk about the cycles, but winter wheat, hence their name, they are planted in the fall. They come up, they are very small little plants. They go dormant in the winter, just like your lawn does. When it warms up in March or April, uh, depending on where you live, your grass starts greening up and then you got to start mowing it again. Same thing with winter wheat crops. It'll come back out of dormancy when the weather warms back up uh, and it'll be harvested typically in the month of May or somewhere thereabouts. Spring wheat, just like corn and soybean, is actually what it says. It is planted in the spring and is harvested uh, in the fall. Looking at other parts of the world, and uh, you probably, if you're in the commodity business, certainly if you are a wheat or a flour buyer, uh, you are quite familiar with this. Uh, certainly everybody on here has heard about the Russia-Ukraine war going on. Uh, the reason that that has been so disruptive to commodity markets is because the breadbasket of the world today, you can make the argument, is Russia and the Ukraine, this Black Sea region. Um, they are one of the largest producers of wheat in the world, but they are the largest, this part of the world, uh, wheat coming out of the Black Sea, this is the largest exporter. Uh, these two countries are a couple of the two largest exporters of wheat. They're also a very large exporter of corn when you look at the Ukraine. Uh, but there is a lot of wheat production uh, and a good bit of corn production that comes out of this world. The veg oil markets, I know there's some veg oil people on here. We get some veg oil out of that part of the world as well, sunflower oil primarily. Uh, there is the Ukraine, again, a very big wheat producer, very big corn producer. 
uh, in the world. This is the Black Sea down here, uh, even though it is not labeled. And when it comes to corn and soybean production, South America is critically important. Now, one of the other differences you'll notice from the Black Sea stuff that I showed you and Brazil and Argentina is that Russia and the Ukraine are on the same side of the equator that we're on. They have a very similar growing cycle that we would have here from a months of the year standpoint. Brazil and Argentina are on the other side, the other hemisphere. So their crop cycle is offset to ours uh, about six months. In the case of Argentina, it is almost exactly six months apart. We are planting and April generally, they are planting six months later than that. Brazil is a little bit different because the equator goes right through about here, as you can see from this map. And so they have a little bit of a different growing cycle. Some of these big producing areas in Brazil are so close to the equator that we're here in the US in the spring, we will plant soybeans and we will plant corn at the same time and we will harvest both in the fall. Brazil will plant beans up in this big part of the growing area. They will plant some first season corn down here. But then when they harvest the beans, which they are doing as we speak, as soon as they're done harvesting beans, they will plant what they call the safrina corn crop. Safrina is Portuguese for little, but it's not little anymore. Uh, that second corn crop that is, that is seeded and grown after the soybeans are harvested, that crop is getting planted right now, actually accounts for over 70% of Brazil's corn production. So uh, you gotta look at the different parts of the world that you're in and, and that you're watching uh, to really have a better idea and a better handle of what that crop cycle is. There's Brazil soybean production. Brazil has been fighting with the US and kind of has overtaken us in recent years uh, for soybean production. Brazil is now the largest soybean producing country uh, on the planet, uh, pretty much equal to us, just a skosh ahead of us. Uh, Argentina is also a large exporter, but Argentina, because the way the government structures their tax, uh, tax code, Argentina is a very large exporter of soybean meal and soybean oil. Brazil is a much larger exporter of the raw soybeans. I'm not going to go through each month of the year. We've got 12 slides here, but uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea, and I'm going to kind of hone in a little bit more on the U.S. as the example. There's not much going on here in January uh, in the U.S. As you guys know, looking out the window, there's still snow on the ground, depending on how far north you live. Uh, farmers are making planting decisions, as they are doing in February. Uh, and when we get out into March and really especially April, this is when things start moving in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, April is probably the primary month where we are planting corn, we are planting soybeans, we are planting some spring wheat. Uh, typically that planting will extend out into May. We like to be all done. You really wanna have your corn planting done uh, before you get very far out into May. Uh, we're planting soybeans generally after we get the corn planted in the U.S. Not always, but in most spots, we're going to get the corn in generally earlier. We will get the soybeans planted after that. Uh, and we like to have that soybeans uh, all in the ground before we get to the end of May. Sometimes when it's a little bit wet and Mother Nature's not cooperative, uh, that can drag out into early June, but it's really not, uh, it's really not ideal. The winter wheat is coming out of dormancy, which it typically starts doing as the weather warms up in March and April. Uh, it is starting to grow. Uh, and when you move out in here to May, a lot of these Northern Hemisphere winter wheat crops, May is kind of the primary month where we are starting to harvest winter wheat. That, will, that winter wheat harvest sometimes can drag into June. Now, there are other countries like India here that is a large wheat producer. The equator goes right through about here. And since this is a kind of a tropical, subtropical sort of environment, um, their winter wheat never actually goes all the way into dormancy, for example. And India is harvesting their winter wheat crop as we speak. Uh, harvest generally starts in uh, February and will stretch out here as we go into the early periods of March. So. Again, I don't want to get too far off into the detail ditch here, but I did want to kind of flip to South America just a little bit. Um, they are generally, we are harvesting crops in the fall, uh, this part of the year. 
they are putting crops in the ground at this point of the year. Brazil will start planting soybeans actually in the middle of September. Uh, that, hard, that, that planting progress in, uh, in Brazil and South America will extend uh, down into Argentina. Argentina is generally planting their soybean crop. Uh, that will trail off all the way into uh, the month of November. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the periods of the year that are generally important. And again, everybody will get these slides. We'll send these slides out or at the very least a, YouTube, a link to the YouTube video. So uh, you could use those slides as a reference. Those are also available on the USDA website. So now let's switch gears here just a little bit and let's get into the crop development stages. So when we were putting this part of the slide deck together, and again, trying to, to heed some of that advice we got from prior calls that said, hey, you got to kind of make this simple for some of us people that are new to the commodity business. You know, we're familiar with the crop cycles. We got on some of the agronomy websites to try to figure out, you know, how are we going to explain this? And the problem with a lot of that is it gets very, very technical. Uh, I swear most of those websites were written by people that have a PhD in agronomy. And if we started talking to you about the R2 stage of corn development, we probably would lose some people. So we kind of tried to break this up into some very general, easy to understand categories. Well, planting is pretty easy. It's when we're putting seeds in the ground. Germination is very similar. It's when those seeds start to emerge from the soil. And I'll show you all of this and I'll show you pictures and talk through it in a little bit more detail. But generally we put the seeds in the ground the seeds come up out of the ground and emerge. Then the crop goes through this vegetative growth stage. All that means is that's where the crop grows up and gets to full size. Um, I'll talk about what those sizes are and, and what to look for. Once the plant grows up and it gets to its full size, its full adult size, just like us humans, that's when the reproductive phase starts. And we'll talk a little bit about how these plants reproduce uh, because it is different. Uh, between corn and soybeans and wheat. But we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll show you some pictures. Uh, once that fruit, we call it fruit, it's not fruit like an apple, but the seeds uh, on the ear of corn, the, the soybean seeds, the little kernels of wheat, that's termed fruit, that seed will spill out. Uh, the plant will take the moisture and nutrients from the ground. It will, it will fill that seed out to its full size. And once that happens, that fruit will begin to ripen. It will ripen. Part of that ripening process is drying down. Uh, I don't know exactly what moisture those seeds are at their peak of fill, but it's got to be over 50% moisture. We can't harvest that fruit, the corn, the soybeans, and the wheat that wet. It won't go through the equipment. We certainly can't store it that wet. And so we're gonna let these crops dry down to levels that they can be harvested and stored. I'll talk a bit more about what those moistures are. And then of course, we harvest it. We pull it up out of the ground. So let's get into the uh, pictures. I think the best way to, to do this, we've just got a lot of pictures in here. Um, the old cliche is a picture is worth a thousand words. And as a dear friend of mine, Jim has always said, you know, it's only a cliche because it's probably true. So. Uh, we've got a lot of pictures in this section, but uh, I don't know if you guys have ever watched a crop being planted, but you can see some of these planters back here. This one is a relatively small, old eight-row planter. Uh, I think that there are planters that John Deere produces right now that will plant, Nate, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, that will plant 48 rows of a crop at the same time. So some of this equipment is getting to be quite enormous. This slide here, I put it in, I took it out, and then I put it back in because it's hard to see. The point that I wanted to make that slide that with that slide is the old, there's an old cliche in this business, plant in the dust and your bins will bust, in, 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 insinuating good yields will come from planting when it's very, very dry. Well, that's not always true. If you plant when it's very, very dry, you get a lot of dust in the air. But the reason that 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 cliche is, is uh, been around so long is that generally speaking, there is a positive correlation between planting your crops early and getting a good yield. Now you might say, well, if it's dry, these things need moisture to grow. Why would that be a good thing? Well, 
It kind of is and it kind of isn't. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Yes, you are going to need moisture, but generally when you have a dry spring early and you can get those crops in, if you get the crops in early and then the spring rains come, you're going to do very, very well. There are, have been several years in my history where we have planted a crop in the dust and got it in early, and it just never really rained very much, and we had a big crop problem. But generally speaking, there is a positive correlation, both here and other parts of the world, between getting that crop in early uh, and having good yields. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons, uh, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into the, uh, the agronomy side of it, but one of the reasons for that is corn has got a very narrow reproductive phase. Most of the U.S. corn crop, we reach about 50% of pollination between the 15th and 20th of July. And for most of the growing areas in the U.S., that corn crop is going to pollinate in a, in a two and a half to three week window. If the weather is not ideal during that window, you can have some serious reproductive problems with the corn crop and therefore the yields will be low. Corn likes moisture to pollinate correctly and corn likes cooler temperatures. Now, in July, cooler temperatures are not defined as 50 or 60 degrees, but really 95 to over 100 degrees certainly is not ideal. The later you get a crop in, the more you're pushing that pollination and fill window, window back into the dog days of summer where you have a higher probability of having heat and less moisture. So that's generally the rationale behind uh, why early planted crops generally do better. When you get those crops in the ground, uh, especially if you have adequate moisture, that seed germinates, that little plant sticks its head out of the ground, uh, for those of you in the Midwest, you know when plants are germinating because when you drive your car past that field and you look down that row, you just got that tiny little line of green going down the little rows that make that up. But uh, if you don't have adequate moisture when you plant the crop, guess what happens? You have incomplete germination. Uh, most of these seeds that we have now with the tremendous, tremendous genetic trait stacks that these seeds, modern uh, seeds have, uh, they are very, very hardy. It doesn't often take a lot of moisture. So even if we have pretty dry conditions, you will see some of these seeds germinate. The problem is, is if you have incomplete germination or only two thirds or three quarters of the, the, the seeds that you put in the ground germinate, clearly you're giving up the, the yield potential to get the most seed that you can get off that acre of ground. So that's why that time of the year is important. Certainly, Moisture is important at that point of the, the year and that part of the cycle. And then you get into the next part of the cycle, the vegetative growth. These are when the plants are growing up. These are when they're getting to be full-size plants. Uh, this field that you're looking at here is actually um, kind of driver wedge right down the road here from the office that we're doing this call from in Waterloo, Nebraska. This particular field is actually owned by Syngenta, one of the big seed companies. Uh, and this is where they grow seed corn and seed beans. In this particular year, you have both. These beans are not seed beans. These are just planted as a buffer crop. This is corn seed this particular year. Uh, and they will rotate them. This is just the part, the road is over here. This is just the part by the road that the irrigation doesn't get to. So they'll plant a buffer crop in there. But this is seed corn that they are growing. Uh, we use the sealed field a lot for pictures because we can actually get corn and beans in the same picture. Uh, but this is just as the plants grow up. Uh, how big is a full-grown soybean plant? Well, depending on the year, depending on the, the, the plant variety, uh, some of the smaller ones, or if we don't have quite enough moisture when we're in this phase, uh, two and a half feet is about as small as they'll get. Some of them maybe only two. Generally, if they have enough moisture, these plants are going to be kind of belt high. Uh, some soybean plants, uh, depending on the genetics, might get a bit taller than that, maybe as much as almost four feet tall. But generally speaking, belt height is a pretty good, pretty good rule of thumb when it comes to a full-grown soybean plant. When it comes to corn, it also depends a bit on the seed variety, but uh, most of the time, these corn plants are going to be at least eight foot tall. Some of them have, you know, will stretch even taller than that, but you can get nine and 10 foot tall corn plants, but most of them are around eight or a little bit higher than taller than that. So now let's talk a little bit about the reproductive phase. Uh, and the thing that is primarily different here in some of these crops, 
A corn crop does not necessarily need a pollinator. It does not need a pollinator to reproduce, a pollinator being a bee or a butterfly or, or some other uh, critter that was basically moving the pollen from the pollen heads to the flower. The corn plant will start sticking these tassels up uh, out of the top of the plant. This is where the pollen comes from. This is the male part of the plant. The pollen then drifts around uh, in the air and falls down on. This plant will also put this small ear up. And if any of you have ever eaten sweet corn, you are familiar with all those damn silks that you got to pull off before you cook it and eat it. The way this works is every one of those silks is a very tiny hollow tube. And every kernel of corn has a location on that ear that has a silk that then comes out of the top. So the pollen floats down off the tassel from the top, blows around and sticks to these hollow tubes. And then it is moved down to germinate the particular seed on the ear of corn. If you've ever pulled the husk off of an ear of sweet corn while you're cleaning it to get ready to eat it, some of those will be nice, big, full, uh, developed ears. Those are corn. Those are ears of corn that, that had probably very good growing conditions when it pollinated. Plenty of moisture, generally speaking, cooler temperatures, and you had a full pollination uh, of that ear of corn. You've also probably peeled some back and you've got little blank spots in there where the little kernel of corn did not develop. That is a, 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 a spot on that ear that just did not reproduce, it did not germinate, generally speaking, because of warmer, hotter, uh, and drier conditions at germination. So those are the reproductive phases, that's how the plant reproduces. And then this is what you get in the early fill stages. You got all these little tiny ears that germinated, these little tiny buds on the ear of corn. Uh, you have the, the seeds that will begin to form here in the pod. This is a uh, this is a pod that is in fill stage, a uh, little bit later fill stage. Those are nearly full size uh, uh, beans. This is very early in the fill stage with this corn picture that we have here. Uh, those seeds are very small, but as you can see here, really we got, looks like we got pretty good germination there. These will fill out and you will get a great big full size ear like this. This is a very early part in the uh, the fill stage for soybeans. These little uh, little pods that are forming on the plant itself. You can see a lot of these are generally only an inch long, a little over an inch long. Those pods will get to be at least two inches long. Most will have three, be uh, three beans in it. Some will have four. Uh, if we don't have enough moisture, uh, didn't get a good uh, didn't get a good reproductive phase. Some of them will only have two, but generally speaking, three. Uh, or a little over three is a pretty good average for what we're gonna see uh, during that fill stage. And then the crop ripens. Uh, we got wheat over here, uh, the, 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 the golden, the amber waves of grain as the song goes. Uh, pretty easy to see that wheat, cr wheat crop harvest or uh, ripening. It goes from green to a beautiful shade of brown or golden. Uh, that's very easy to see. Soybeans aren't quite so pretty. You get the big, green, beautiful fields, uh, and then you start to see, generally in September, some yellow flecks, some yellow leaves start to show up. Uh, when you start seeing those very first yellow leaves, if Mother Nature cooperates, generally you can harvest that bean field in two weeks. These fields will go from green to yellow to brown very, very quickly over a, a very short period of time. Corn. One of the ways you can tell the corn uh, is, is ripe and ready to go, might not have the, the moisture level that the farmer desires just yet, but those ears of corn will actually flip over and point down. If I back up here, you can see that the ears of corn are actually sticking out this way. As those ears of corn dry down, now we've peeled the husk back on these for the picture, but they will actually point down. That's an important distinction that I wanted to talk about. Generally, farmers like to harvest their soybeans at around 12 or a little over 12% moisture. That's when they go through the combine the best. Um, that's also, they're, they're, they're optimal for taking them to market. If you take your soybeans to market very dry at eight or 9%, you're actually losing weight. Uh, that's a loss of yield. Farmers don't like to do that. They like to take them in. Uh, they like to harvest and store the corn at around 15, 15 and a half percent. Sometimes they'll harvest it a little wetter than that and dry it down. 
The reason I mention this is I, uh, this is another important distinction that we get into quite often at harvest time. And it really will govern, uh, the weather at harvest will govern which one of these crops farmers take out of the field more quickly. Soybeans will lose moisture much more quickly than corn will when they're ripening. They will also pick that moisture back up much more quickly if you get a wet spell at harvest. So farmers are going to go after the beans whenever they can go after the beans. Corn can sit out in the field a lot longer. Corn is going to dry down much more slowly than soybeans do, and it is going to take moisture up in wet periods. It's because corn also, the, the hull is a little thicker on the seed, but corn comes with its own umbrella. Um, that husk is down around the ear. It protects the ear. Uh, you've got a lot larger period of time in the fall to get your corn out. And there's some beautiful harvest pictures. I think the only thing I wanted to note here, use a little bit different heads to harvest wheat and soybeans versus corn. So you might see a tractor that's got this big wheel on it. Those are generally set up to harvest wheat or corn. You see others that just have the big point sticking out of the front of them. Those are to go down the ears of corn and harvest it. So it's the same general piece of equipment. The combines are all the same, but there will be a different head on it. This is called the head, the front part of it. So let's talk a little bit about supply demand here. Now, I got a couple examples in here, but the point we're trying to make is we've got the question at the top, how much is too much, how much is not enough, and how much is just right? Well, just enough, we call the Goldilocks zone in this office. It's when you don't, you don't have uh, excessive stocks like you have up here stockpiles. It's not when you have very low uh, uh, supplies here when prices go through the roof. It's the just right zone. And really, it depends on the commodity that you're looking at. It also depends on the part of the world, believe it or not. That's wheat. Here is corn. Uh, the example that I wanted to give you here, this is in bushels. This is another way that markets look at our ending supplies. These are called ending stocks, how much grain we have left at the end of the year while we're waiting for harvest to start. This is expressed as a percentage. That percentage is termed stocks to use ratio. And what it is, is very simply an inventory of how much of the crop is left at the end of the crop cycle relative to what our total overall use was in that particular year. So you can look, you can see ending stocks expressed in bushels. You can have ending stocks uh, expressed as a percentage, which is the percentage of the total use that you had that year. So those are the two ways to look at it. And you have this Goldilocks zone. Anytime you're in here, that's kind of just right. It's not too much, it's not too little, it's just the right amount. So how do we get to those, those stocks levels and how do we do it? How does the USDA, how do private analysts uh, look at this and how do they calculate and how do they forecast this? Well, there's a lot of numbers on this page. Do not be intimidated. I'm just gonna take you through an inventory but it's just like if you were selling widgets out of a widget store, you would have an inventory of widgets at any given point in time. You would have shipments of widgets coming at you that you would add to your total supply, and then you would have prospective sales that you would subtract off of that. The USDA does the same exact thing. Look at this middle column here for me. This is this crop that we are currently utilizing, and this is the USDA's current estimate from this month's report. More on reports in a second. Planted a little over 88 and a half million acres last year of, of corn. This is what the harvested acres that we had. This is the average yield that we got over off of those harvested acres. Therefore, we had a crop of just over 13.7 billion bushels. You add to that what we had left at the end of last crop year, the little tiny bit that you import, and that gives you the total supply of corn that we've got to use this year. And then you start subtracting off the demand sectors. We feed this to animals, eat, eat this much for food. We use this much to make ethanol. We export this much, at least that's the current estimate for all of those, meaning when you take the, the total supply and you subtract off what you expect to use, you're gonna have this much left at the end of the year, which is one and about a one and a quarter billion bushels, which is about 9% of use. Now, think of it this way. 
well, we have some left. That's a good thing. Why can't we go all the way to zero on ending stocks? Here's why. The crop year ends at the end of August. The new crop year starts at the beginning of September, but you're really not harvesting that crop quite that early. You're harvesting that crop starting usually in mid-September. It can be later September. You're going to harvest the bulk of it in October. And if Mother Nature slows you down with early harvest, if you do the math here, 9% of a 12-month year is only about a month's worth of usage. So that is what you have to get you from the beginning of September to harvest. The lower that number is, the closer you are to the edge of that proverbial cliff, if you will, of that harvest cliff of where you've got to get new crop supplies off. So that's how the USDA looks at it. And not surprisingly, in years, this is your stocks to use ratios down here for corn, and this is your resulting price. This is three bucks, this is seven bucks. Not surprisingly, in years where you have adequate or ample stocks to use, remember our Goldilocks zone, right? It was over 12% of use. You generally have cheaper prices. As supplies get tighter, those prices start going up, not linearly, but geometrically. Uh, you can have a 100 million bushel change in expected ending stocks up here that might cause prices to change a dollar a bushel. That same 100 million bushel change in prospective ending stocks down here where you have plenty might only cause prices to change 10 or 15 or 20 cents a bushel. So this is the relative relationship that you can see here. And almost all commodities have this same relationship. Uh, this is the relationship between supplies and use. So now let's talk very briefly about hedging. Uh, I don't want to get too far off in this detail ditch, but we're going to pick up the clip that we started today with, uh, and we're going to show you another uh, 45 or 60 seconds of that same clip. And then there are other commodities like frozen orange juice and gold, though, of course, gold doesn't grow on trees like oranges. <laughs> Clear so far? Yeah. Good, William. Now, uh, some of our clients are speculating that the price of gold will rise in the future, and we have other clients who are speculating that the price of gold is going to fall. Uh, they place their orders with us, and we buy or sell their gold for them. Tell them the good part. <laughs> uh, the good part, William, is that uh, no matter whether our clients make money or lose money, Duke and Duke get the commissions. Well, what do you think, Valentine? Well, it sounds to me like you guys are a couple of bookies. <laughs> I told you I understand. <laughs> well, we, we look at uh, commodity futures. Uh, there are movies like this that kind of, I think, poke fun at the speculative side of some of these financial in instruments that we have, soybean futures, corn futures, most of the items, the commodity items that I showed you on one of those early slides have got derivative instruments that are financial tools that are used to offset loss. Now, we don't really have the time on this call, and as I mentioned, I don't want to get too far off into the detail ditch, but these instruments were not strictly invented so that people can speculate, contrary to what some people might tell you. Um, they were originally designed in the 1800s when the Chicago Board of Trade was founded, because one of the problems that farmers would have then is that prices at harvest time, when there was a glut of grain, would get so cheap, and, and farmers didn't have places to store it all the time. And then at other times of the year, these products would be in very, very short supply, because, you know, and, and like, for example, flour mills that buy wheat would run out because they wouldn't have it. And the price of flour would go very, very high. And so <clears throat> these instruments allow companies that produce the grain or the, the, the commodity that store the grain or commodity and other companies that use the grain or the commodity, like a lot of your food companies, to actually use these financial instruments as a proxy to buy or sell needs that they are going to have in the future, that's why they are called futures contracts, to offset some of that price risk. 
I suspect there are people in here from manufacturing companies. There are people in here that are listening that work for a CPG, big retail brand company. Uh, there are people in here that work for food service companies. And being able to offset that, that risk that you have in the future, because if you're working for a restaurant, for example, it takes a long time to raise your menu price, but the price of one of those commodity items that you buy uh, might go up. And if you if the price of the stuff you're buying goes up, you can't change your selling price on the menu, that is margin compression. These instruments are used to offset those financial changes and help you kind of lock in, manage your business and run your margin. That is what we do for a living is help companies understand and manage those margin risks. I don't want to get too far off into that ditch, but there are speculators. Everybody looks at speculators as bad, but the speculators do play a role in providing liquidity in these markets. So there is a good thing that the speculator does. Sometimes the speculator gets a bit carried away, but Generally speaking, that's how the, the pieces of the market work. And again, like I said, I don't want to get too far off into that, that detailed ditch. Let me take a couple minutes talking about the USDA and some of the reports that they give us uh, over the course of the year. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reports across all these different commodities that I showed you earlier, but we're just going to focus on the agricultural, the, the grains here in the US. And the U.S. gives us about 15 reports every year. Now, that sounds a little complicated. It really isn't. Every single month, at around the 10th of the month, sometimes a couple, three days earlier, sometimes a couple, two or three days later, but around the 10th of the month, they give us their monthly WASD report is what the trade calls it. WASD stands for World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimate. Okay, so we get 12 of those over the course of the year. The USDA gives us several other reports over the course of the year. We get one at the end of June where they tell us what our stockpiles were at the beginning of June. Probably should pause there and tell you that four times a year at the end of every quarter, they tell us what we have. So on December 1st, remember the crop year starts on September 1st. They tell us at the end of that first quarter of that crop year on December 1st, they tell us what we have left in the checkbook, as we like to call it, how much, how many, how much corn we have left, how much soybeans we have left, how much wheat we have left. Another one on March 1st, another one on June 1st, another one on September 1st. That September 1st report uh, is the official beginning stocks for this year's crop and ending stocks for last year's crop. We talked about that in the supply demand section. Why? What you are looking at in this particular chart is these reports are ranked relative to importance. Now, what do these numbers mean? Well, we ranked relative importance based on how much the market moved on report day relative to where it closed the next day. In other words, how much did this particular report disrupt the market? Why is this an important report? Well, we get some important information in June. We not only get the June 1 stocks number, uh, we also get our final wheat production, how much wheat we produced in the year, this crop we just harvested in May uh, in, in early June that I talked about. Why is this March report important? Well, we get our March one stocks report and the USDA tells us at the end of March how many acres of soybeans, how many acres of corn, how many acres of wheat that they expect farmers to plant. It's called the planting intentions report. So you kind of get the idea here that they are keeping us updated all the way through the course of the year, not only on these WASDI reports, which is what they expect the current supply demand balance sheet to look like, but at other times of the year, they also measure, uh, measure and estimate. They estimate what the farmers in, in possession of. They actually measure commercial stocks and tell us, um, uh, so to speak, uh, how much grain we have left in the checkbook. Uh, at that particular, the end of the quarter, so that the market can kind of keep track of where we are, how much do we have left, are we using it too fast, in which case prices might go up to try to slow usage, um, are we not using it fast enough, or, or, or do we have more left in the checking account, in which cases prices can often relax. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that we get a lot of data from the USDA over the course of a crop year. Uh, that helps us and helps the market understand 
where we're at and how this balance, this very delicate market balance between supply and demand, uh, how we are tracking with that. Question for you, Dave. Yeah. How is it measured? Is a question. Uh, how is uh, uh, how is the? I assume that question is how is these the, these days measured? A good question. This number here tells you that over this five year period, 2007 to 2016, in this particular example, uh, this would tell you this is for corn. This would tell you that the market moved an average of over 27 and a half cents per bushel that day, the on report day, relative to where the market closed the day before the report day, if that's what the question is. How the supply demand is balanced, remember we showed you the corn balance sheet with all the numbers on it on one of the prior slides? That's how the USDA keeps track of their estimate of where the, how, what supplies they think we're gonna have left at the end of the year. Um, one of the other things I guess I'll mention, and then I'll close this up here for the day, the USDA gets a lot of flack in the industry. Uh, they get reports that sometimes uh, surprise those of us in the market. Uh, sometimes those numbers seem almost unbelievable. Uh, and the USDA does catch a lot of criticism. Some of it, I suppose, deserve. But when you look at the USDA and you look at the data that they provide, I have come to be a bit more respectful of that over the course of my career for a couple of reasons. First off, the USDA generally does more research and has more data points than any anybody, any other analyst does. Talked about crop size and estimating that. When they're looking in the fall of the year and trying to estimate the size of the crop, they have got literally thousands and thousands and thousands of field surveys that they do. That's only one example. The other reason that I come to respect it is that while you may not like it sometimes and it may not be perfect sometimes, uh, you find out that the reporting that we have here in the US is really generally far better than just about anywhere else on the planet. So uh, generally speaking, I think our USDA does a pretty good job. So that's the end of our webinar today. Uh, as you might suspect, your head might be reeling. Uh, when you look at this, you say, how am I supposed to keep track of this? There is an enormous amount of moving parts uh, and variables when it comes to analyzing commodities. Shameless plug intended, by the way. Um, what are those? Well, you got some of them in the word chart we have here, but one of the other ones I did want to point out here, you see political conflict here. You see political conflict. I think it's down here. here there it is down here somewhere. Um, this is a perfect example of a variable that the market didn't even know it had to deal with. When this war in the Ukraine erupted last February, market wasn't expecting that. Remember, I talked about that's kind of the breadbasket of the world. Uh, a lot of wheat and a lot of corn comes out of there. That is really one of the bigger causes of this big market disruption that we've lived through over the last year. Uh, other political things can affect it, like our renewables fuels policy. Clearly, weather affects it. Uh, input costs affect it. Last year, we had record fertilizer prices when we were trying to plant our corn, which uses an enormous amount of nitrogen fertilizer. That can affect farmer decisions. Government policy, storage costs, um, there's just so many different things that you have to keep track of. So at any rate, uh, that's our webinar today. I don't know if there's any more questions that you see, Martha. Um, somebody was asking for a similar chart for soybean oil, but I don't think we have it in the deck. Yeah, we don't have it in the deck, but we certainly can get that to us. Uh, you will get an email from us uh, with the, the, the slides and the data and a YouTube video that, that will cover all the audio and, and video that we've had on this call. Um, just go ahead and email us back. We can get that out to you. Um, uh, and anything else that we can do, you'll also get on that email from us uh, kind of a list of some of our services if you think that there's anything that uh, uh, that we might be able to help you with uh, going down the road. So I don't want to make this into a sales pitch. So I will end it there. Glad you could all join us. And as we end up all of our commodity calls with, please be careful out there.